Last week, if you were here, we talked about revival. And in particular, we spent time focusing on the great revival of 1857 that began in New York City, uh, started by laymen such as Jeremiah Lampier. And it was amazing to see how the whole world was impacted by that moving of God. And so before we look at some other material here this morning, I'd like to show you a very, very important passage. This is found in the book of Judges, chapter 2, verse 8. I think all of you, or at least most of you, would know a little bit about Joshua, the leader of God's people after the death of Moses. Then Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. Verse 9 of this passage talks about where he is born. And then verse 10 says, all that generation also were gathered to their fathers. That means all of the Exodus generation were dead. They, they had passed away. And there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord, nor yet the work which he had done for Israel. And so not only did this new generation not know the Lord himself in a personal way, they didn't know or understand anything about their spiritual heritage as a people, as a nation. Needless to say, the Jews had a rich heritage of seeing God work among them as a people in just amazing absolutely amazing ways. But this new generation, they didn't know anything about this work of God. It's amazing. When you think about it, in my view, this is exactly where we are at in our day. Very few people seem to have any information with regard to the rich spiritual heritage that we have as, as a nation, our country, has an amazing heritage of spiritual revival and awakenings that have literally impacted the world. We're going to talk a little bit about that this morning. But first, to go back to last week, I'd like to show you and remind you of this important definition of revival. This is kind of an academic definition, but a good one. Number one, revival is a sovereign act of God. That means God is the one who does this. We don't create it. We can't. It's entirely the work of God. The effect is this. It renews God's people, uh, sets them on fire in the heart. It, it just explodes among them. The effect further is the regenerating of lost. In other words, unsaved men and women by the thousands come to know the Lord. The effect of that is the reformation of society. Things change. Culture begins to change. And then, of course, lastly, there is the reaffirming of blessed cardinal doctrines of Holy Scripture. So people come back to the authority of God's Word, the Bible. Now, I pointed out last week that in our country, we have only seen three major revivals on a national level that have fulfilled all the criteria of, of this, uh, this definition. We've only seen three. Here they are. The three great national revivals. The first great awakening 1720 to 1740. By the way, it didn't end in 1740. It actually crested and it continued for years, uh, far, uh, year, yield, years further. Then there is the second great awakening in the early 1800s. And then the one we talked about last week, the layman's prayer revival 
of 1857. Now, as I said last week, there have been a lot of other revivals that have taken place in our country, in, in cities, in regions, uh, in churches, in denominations, uh, certainly in uh, on college campuses such as Asbury in the year of 1970. And all of these other revivals that have taken place were were very powerful and very dramatic. Uh, but the three that I'm putting up for you, they're different. They are unique in terms of they impacted the entire nation. Wherever there were people in this country in those days, they understood and knew of this time of awakening. In fact, the whole world, Europe, uh, England, Ireland, uh, Germany, France, Spain, they were all, all impacted to some degree by these great events, and in particular, the first great awakening. So, that said, I'd like to take you back a little bit to the 1700s this morning and talk about the first great awakening. And the, the first thing that I want to show you is this. I want you to see at least a little of the cultural background of this time when this great move of God took place. Let me read this paragraph. In the early 1700s, a European philosophical movement called the Enlightenment swept across America, also called the Age of Reason. Uh, the Age of Reason was really the beginning of humanism. The idea that we don't need God, God, we have a mind and you can figure uh, things out for yourself. And if you believe in God, God gave you a mind and so he wants you to use it Forget about that Bible. It's up to you to make your own way. Uh, this era, notice, laid the foundation for a scientific rather than religious worldview. That sounds familiar. This also allows for the idea and thinking called deism. Deism is the idea that God created everything as we see it and have it and know it. He put everything in motion. We're here, but he's off somewhere. We don't know where. He doesn't get involved in our lives in a personal way. That's the thinking of deism. He is what uh, some refer to as the absentee landlord. He created all things and who knows where God is. Uh, God is, uh, is there, but he doesn't get intricately involved in our life. That's the thinking of deism. Now look at the rest of this. Because of this influence, as a result, there was a diminishing of religion and especially the role that religion played in the early day lives of American colonists. This resulted in complacency and spiritual dryness among those who were believers. As a result of the Enlightenment, true religion diminished and moral corruption was evolving at a rapid pace. Materialism was taking hold of the hearts of men. And among the intellectual elite, there was a scorn for the message of biblical faith. Actually, there were many people in those days, uh, the intellectual types, who would refer to themselves as infide or infidel. Now, that term to us is kind of a term of derision. But back at this time, they referred to themselves as infidels with a great deal of pride. I am not a believer in that book called the Bible. I am an infidel. And proudly they would uh, proclaim themselves to be such. Now, I'm showing you this this morning because I want you to see what was the moral and spiritual environment of this day and time because it was in this moral and spiritual environment that God began to move. However, this awakening was different in the way it began. For example, in 1857, 
the revival that we spoke about last week, if you recall, it was, uh, it was lay driven. That is, people in the pews were the ones that God used, men like Jeremiah Lanfear and others. However, in the Great Awakening, it, God primarily was using pastors and evangelists. It, it wasn't that they were exclusively being used, but in a primary sense, God was using them. For example, here are two guys. These are both of the Dutch Reformed Presbyterian Church. You know something about that, don't you? Uh, the guy on the left, William Tennant. The guy on the right, I couldn't find a pick. <laughs> but I found his tombstone to let you know he did exist. <laughs> his name is Theodore Frelinghausen. Frelinghausen. Uh, these guys were used by God in the farmlands of New Jersey and Pennsylvania. They were mightily used. And what is amazing to me is the simplicity of their message. They started to proclaim in all of the churches, they started to teach again what had somehow been lost since the days of Reformation, the message of being born again. They started telling these church people, you must be born again. Uh, the day, in that day and time, the thought was that uh, all you needed to be was a good churchman, someone who went to church, who lived a moral life, cared about his neighbor, helped out where he could, and the thought was that was being a good Christian. Well, these guys came along and they started to proclaim everywhere the message of the new birth. And as soon as they began to speak this message, God began to move. And all of a sudden, church after church, village after village, city after city was literally set on fire by God. Whole villages, in some cases, came to the Lord. Whole communities of, let's say, a thousand, two thousand people, in some cases, whole villages came to the Lord. Eventually, there were so many converts that this guy on the left, Mr. William Tennant, he started a college. They needed to train ministers. There were so many converts. They needed to train pastors and uh, uh, get them out into the field teaching uh, the, the new uh, believers that had come to faith. So he started a college that was referred to as the Log College. Later it was referred to as the College of New Jersey. And today we refer to it as Princeton, one of the elite colleges in the, in the Northeast. It was begun, Princeton was begun exclusively for the purpose of training pastors. In fact, it's kind of interesting, all but three of the present day uh, Ivy League schools in the New England states, all but three of them were begun for the purpose of training ministers back during the time of the Great Awakening. Brown Universe, University, Dartmouth University, Rutgers, uh, Yale, all of these were established for this purpose. It's also interesting that most of the men who signed the Declaration of Independence in 1776, most of them were converted during the time that I'm discussing, the time of the Great Awakening. In my view, the Great Awakening is actually responsible for much of the information found in the Declaration of Independence and much of the information found in our Constitution. And without question, it's the reason we have separation of church and state. I mean, that was unheard of. Uh, prior to this time. In fact, even now, if you go to Europe, uh, church and state are mixed. I have a nephew who planted a church in, uh, outside of London in the community of Canterbury, England. It's a university town. 
planted that church and it's going along quite well actually. But quarterly, he has to report to the state the things that are taking place in his church. He has to report about the people that are at work for him. The state and the church is intermingled. Well, as you know, that is no longer a fact in our country, and thank God. Now, up in the northeastern part of the United States, what we refer to as the New England states, God raised up another guy, powerful man of God. You may have heard of him. His name is Jonathan Edwards. Historians say, this guy, by the way, was a congregationalist. That is, he was a part of that denomination. Historians say that he was the greatest mind or the greatest theological mind since the time of Paul the Apostle in the early church. For example, by the time he reached 12 years of age, he was proficient in Greek, in Hebrew, and Latin. Now, I play around with Greek. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's tough sledding. He, he was proficient in all of those. When he was 13 years of age, he went to Yale University. And by the time he was 17, he was a teacher at Yale University. Eventually, he went on to be a pastor in a congregational church in Northampton, Massachusetts. And he actually began as an associate to his grandfather. His grandfather was a man by the name of Solomon Stoddard. He was a, a big guy uh, who believed in scripture and who believed in revival. But after a year of working together, Mr. Stoddard passes away. And so Jonathan Edwards becomes the, the, the pastor, the senior guy in this congregation. Now before he takes this assignment, he was married to this woman. Uh, her name is Sarah Edwards, as you can see. And they had 13 children. I, I mean, try to imagine 13 little uh, rugrats running all over the house. Can you imagine that? 13 children. Uh, by the way, she would later on write this book. Do you see it on the right? It, it reads, marriage to a difficult man. <laughs> However, don't misunderstand. She wasn't writing about him being a difficult person. She adored his, uh, her husband, Jonathan Edwards. She loved him deeply. In fact, I would suggest she's probably a part of the reason why he became the man of God that he did. She meant that in this sense. This was a guy who was a pastor. He read and wrote. He studied and wrote 14 hours every day, except on the Sabbath day. He, he had to take out time also for other duties in the church and to be involved with his children. However, he spent one hour a day with his wife. They would take that exclusive time, spend it together, walking, riding horses, spending time talking about God, the things that he had studied, and talking, of course, about their children. Now, by the way, if you trace the lineage of this couple in terms of their kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, let me show you this. This guy, A.E. Winship, I never heard of him until this past week, he studied what happened to the descendants of this couple. He studied 1,400 of the descendants up to the year 1900. In other words, beginning around 1730 up to 1900, he took a look at 1,400 of their descendants. And here's what he found. The descendants included 13 college presidents, 65 professors, 100 lawyers and a dean of a law school, 30 judges, 66 physicians, and a dean of a medical school, and 80 holders of public office, 
including three U.S. senators, mayors of three large cities, governors of three states, a vice president of the United States, and a controller of the United States Treasury. They had written over 135 books and edited 18 journals and periodicals. Many had entered the ministry. Over 100 were missionaries and others were on mission boards. Now, why do I show you this? Because it's the blessing of God. This is called the blessing of historical impact, where your life as a man, a woman of God, affects your children and your grandchildren and your uh, great-grandchildren. And there is the blessing that flows of historical impact impact. And in this case, all of this pivots off of what is happening to this couple in the Great Awakening. Now, to take you back to his church, after the death of his grandfather, Edwards began to carry a burden for young people. Young people were turning away from God in mass because of the influence of the Enlightenment period, the influence of deism. And so Edwards began to pray a lot and preach to his congregation and to these kids, and he began to talk about revival. Some of you may remember one of the great messages that he gave that is still talked about today. It's called this, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. That message is, is so powerful. Read it for yourself sometime on the internet. It's based on a text out of Deuteronomy 32, 35, where God says, to me belongs vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time, for the day of their calamity is at hand. Now, by the way, when he gave this message, he didn't rant, he didn't rave, he wasn't a screamer. I, I just don't get off on screaming. I don't know about you. He wasn't a screamer. He read his sermon, but he read it with passion. And he read it uh, in the power of the Spirit. And it's interesting, the first time he gave his message. By the way, let me just share one piece with you. This is a paragraph in his message. I can't read that, so let me read this. <laughs> He wrote this, or spoke this, you are probably unaware of this. You notice that you are being kept out of hell, but you do not see that it is God's hand keeping you out. Instead, you look at other things, such as your good health, the way you take care of yourself, and the things you do to preserve your life. But in fact, these things are nothing. Nothing. If God withdrew his hand, these things would no more keep you from falling then thin air holds up a person suspended in it. Your own wickedness weighs you down like lead and is dragging you down toward hell with great weight and force. Again, if God would let you go, you would immediately sink, quickly descending and plunging into the bottomless gulf. Ooh. <laughs> you can see in just his words and no doubt the way he communicated. First time he gave the message, 300 in his church came to the Lord. After he gave that message, he began to itinerate. So he traveled about preaching this message and others, hundreds and hundreds and thousands. Thousands. It's estimated that 60,000 people came to the Lord under his influence. And by the way, I want you to understand something. In those days, they didn't give an altar call. Altar calls weren't uh, even thought of until the days of Charles Finney. They gave the message and relied upon the spirit and the word and the power of each to bring a person to conviction and to conversion, to new birth. Uh, they would actually, in order to uh, in order to validate someone as truly converted, you went before your church examination board. 
And they would ask you pertinent questions about your salvation. And only then were you then counted as a true convert after you've gone through that process. So they were very careful. And yet hundreds and thousands of people were coming to God. And so this is part really of an amazing time of revival and awakening. Here's what Edwards wrote at that time. Let me read this quickly. He said, there was scarcely a single person in the town, old or young, left unconcerned about the great things of the eternal world. Those who were wont to be the vainest and loosest and those who had been disposed to think and speak lightly of vital and experimental religion were now generally subject to great awakenings, meaning they were coming to God. And the work of conversion was carried on in a most astonishing manner and increased more and more. Souls did as it were come by flocks to Jesus Christ. From day to day for many months might be seen evident instances of sinners brought out of darkness into marvelous light and delivered out of a horrible pit and, the, and from the miry clay and set upon a rock with a new song of praise in their mouths. This work of God and the number of true saints multiplied soon, soon made a glorious alteration in the town. He's talking about Northampton, Massachusetts. So that in the spring and summer following in 1735, the town seemed to be full of the presence of God. It never was so full of love nor of joy, and yet so full of distress as it was then. Why distress, do you suppose? Men and women under conviction of sin. He says there were remarkable tokens of God's presence in almost every house. It was a time of joy in families on account of salvation being brought to them. Parents rejoicing over their children as newborn and husbands over wives and wives over husbands. The doings of God were then seen in his sanctuary, that is, in a place like this. God's day, meaning Sunday, was a delight. Our public assemb assemblies were then so beautiful. The congregation was alive in God's service. Everyone earnestly intent on the public worship. Every hearer eager to drink in the words of the minister as they came from his mouth. The assembly in general were often in tears while the word was preached. Some weeping with sorrow and distress, others with joy and love others with pity and concern for the souls of their neighbors. I think if you read between the lines, the one thing that stands out in, in what was happening is the presence of, of God's spirit and life. Everything was animated with life. God's people were alive like never before. Awakened to God in union with, in fellowship with God. And there was a dyna, dynamism and a, and a power that was upon those who taught the word of God. Actually, what I'm reading now is a part of a book written by Edwards. That's it. The title of it is A Narrative of the surprising work of God in the conversions of Northampton, Massachusetts. This book, by the way, was put into print and sent about, and people uh, were reading it to one another. There was actually started in, for example, in Virginia and South Carolina, there was this idea of reading rooms. Uh, there used to be a reading room in Monongahela back many years ago. And the idea is that people would get together and someone would read these sermons to the, to the other folks. And as they did, these reading rooms sprung up all over the place and, and people were getting converted just through the reading of these sermons. Amazing, amazing what God was doing. Now, there is one other man of God that I will mention this morning, back during this time, and there he is, the Anglican pastor from England. His name is George 
Whitfield. Some say that he's like the Babe Ruth of the Great Awakening. He comes along in 1740 and he just lights up the whole of the United States. After his conversion in 1717, he becomes such a, a powerful preacher of God's word that everyone knows at least of him. Historians say that George Whitfield is really the first celebrity in the new America. This man with a thunderous voice and this anointing of God that is all over him. By the way, uh, last week I made a misstatement. I said that Ben Franklin said you could hear his voice so unique up to a mile away. I was wrong. Uh, let me read what he actually said. I quote Ben Franklin. He said, you could back up from where he was preaching and you could still hear him up to a half mile. Not a mile, but a half mile. All right. <laughs> so I stand corrected. Nobody corrected me, but I, I did see that uh, in my studies this week. The truth is, imagine this, with no electronic equipment, he did field preaching. He spoke, according to Franklin, at one time, he spoke to a group of 33,000 people. And they could all hear him. Such power uh, in his voice, but no doubt power through the Holy Spirit. I want to read, before we finish, this story, a man by the name of Nathan Cole. This is a bit of a condensed, paraphrased account. Uh, Nathan Cole was a farmer in Connecticut, and he was saved on the day that he will write about. Uh, he was an eyewitness of that time. Here's what he writes. Excuse me. I was born February 15th, 1711, and born again October 1741. When I heard that Mr. Whitfield was coming to preach in Middletown, I was in my field at work. I dropped my tool and ran home to my wife and told her to hurry. My wife and I rode my horse as fast as I thought the horse could bear. When we neared Middletown, I heard a noise like a low rumbling thunder and soon saw it was the noise of horses. As I came closer, it seemed like a steady stream of horses and their riders all of a lather and foam with sweat, their breath rolling out of their nostrils with every jump. Can't you just picture that? In a cool morning, the dew uh, on the ground and these horses, it's just cool enough you can see the steam rolling off of them. Every horse, he says, seemed to go with all his might to carry his rider to hear news from heaven for the saving of souls. It made me tremble to see the sight, how the world was in a struggle. When we got to the meeting house where there were three or 4,000 people assembled, I turned and looked back and the land and banks of the river looked black with people and horses all along the 12 miles. When I saw Mr. Whitfield, he looked almost angelic, a young, slim, slender youth. And hearing how God was with him everywhere put me into a trembling fear. And here's the key. I saw that my righteousness would not save me. And that's the most important thing that anyone could ever discover. In America, you talk to the average person, well, if you stood before God today, what do you suppose would happen? Well, I would just tell God I'm a pretty good person. I do good things, I'm not that bad. I've heard that so many times. But the Bible says your righteousness is as filthy rags in the sight of a just and holy God. And this man on that day saw that his righteousness would not save him. And he turned to God and he received as a free gift the righteousness of the person of Jesus Christ himself. 
Now, there are many other stories that are significant that I could tell you about. For example, this guy, Gilbert Tennant, he was very controversial and a bit of a divisive person. The reason he was divisive is because he was telling people to leave churches who had unconverted pastors. He wrote that little book on the left side of the screen. Uh, the title of that book is The Danger of an Unconverted Ministry. And this book went out after print, and they began to read it in the reading rooms, and people started leaving all of the dead churches. And you can imagine all of the heat that he began to generate as a result of that. But God used him in, in a mighty way. And then there were these guys, Charles and John Wesley, the Wesley brothers, the founders of what we call Methodism today. By the way, Methodism is the idea, very simply, they taught the idea that being a Christian was methodical. It starts with the new birth, yes, but then there's a method to being a believer. You study the Bible, you read the Bible, you pray, you go to church, uh, you witness to others when possible, you hang out and fellowship with the people of God. There's a method. You, you don't fly by the seat of your pants, you have a method. That's what they taught. And so Methodism began to take root dynamically in the southern states uh, like South Carolina and Vi uh, Georgia and, and Virginia. So during the Great Awakening, these Wesley guys sent men from England and Ireland to preach in the states. Men like Francis Asbury, Great Methodist heritage there. Robert Strawbridge, Philip Embry, uh, Thomas Koch. These guys were firebrands of, of the Methodist movement. And God began to use them and in amazing ways. Now I could go on and on, folks, with stories like this. But I'm trying to convey one simple thing to you this morning. This is the bottom line. We are living today in a country that has drifted far, far from God. There is a type of deism everywhere in the country. It's a little different, but nevertheless, very much like the deism of that day or the enlightenment of that day. The parallel of these two uh, seasons of history are absolutely amazing to me. Deism is the idea, and you hear people say this, oh, I believe in God, but that's the end of it. God has no role, no work, no idea where we're at. God is just the creator, and he set things in motion, and it's up to us to figure out what's best. That's what the average American believes today. In fact, that's what the average American in church America believes today. But the truth is, God can turn that around. If he did it in the past, he can do it now. He can turn it around. I want to tell you something. Politics is not the answer. A lot of people seem to think that today. Oh, if we can just get a good conservative in the White House, then things are going to change. It might change a little bit. It might be a speed bump, but we're moving in a direction away from God. Make no mistake about it. And politics is not the answer. Now, don't get me wrong. I believe in voting. I believe in being a good steward of of where God has deployed me. I want to be involved. I want to know what's going on in my country. And I vote. I vote. I, but I will tell you this. I never vote, vote for men or women who are in favor of murdering babies. <clears throat> I would not. I would not want to stand before God and explain to him why I was in favor of voting for someone who believed in murdering babies. Now, I, that might just offend you and set you off, but I'm sorry, I'm right, and you're wrong if you're against that. <laughs> but
But, but politics is not the answer for our country. That's the bottom line. Politics is not the answer. We need a new awakening. We need a revival. And it has to start with me. With me, Bill Bailey. And it has to start with you. I can't worry about what everybody else is doing. I have to be concerned about me. Me. And my heart and my life before God. Let me close with this Psalm 85. I'm going to speak on this in the next week or two. I'm not sure when. Notice what the psalmist says. Lord, you poured out blessings on your land. You restored the fortunes of Israel. Can you see this is past tense? He's looking back at the history of Israel. You forgave the guilt of your people. Yes, you covered all their sins. You held back your fury. You kept back your blazing anger. Now, restore us again, O God of our salvation. Put aside your anger against us once more. Will you be angry with us always? Will you prolong your wrath to all generations? And then in the very next verse, look at this. Won't you revive us again? Why? So your people can rejoice in you. Lord, come and revive us. Awaken your people that our joy would just spill out. Look at verse 7. Show us your unfailing love. Show us. In other words, he's looking for something that he can see. Some demonstration of God's life and power. Show us your unfailing love, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. I listen carefully to what God the Lord is saying. For he speaks peace to his faithful people. But let them not return to their foolish ways. Now look at this. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. Why? So our land will be filled with his glory. That's revival. When the church is full of God's glory. When your home is full of God's glory. When the school is full of of God's glory, when the courthouse is full of God's glory, when the news media is full of God's glory, when God moves in such a supernatural, mighty way that the glory of the Lord is felt and tasted by everyone. That's what we're after. That's what we're praying for. That's what we're asking God to bring about. So let's pray.